Hi everyone, this is Rob Lashley with MMORPG.com. Today I have with me Mark Jacobs, co-founder of City State Entertainment. You want to say hello, Mark? Hey guys. Hey Rob. Thanks for taking the time out of your day to join us. I know you uh, got to be busy with this uh, project you're working on. Just a little bit, yeah. But this is uh, this is only the beginning. If uh, the Kickstarter funds, it's going to get a whole heck of a lot busier uh, very quickly. I can only imagine. So you've been doing a lot of developer blogs over the last few days, few weeks, and uh, you brought up a lot of interesting points. And I guess yesterday is probably one of my favorites so far about choices and having player choices mean something, and especially in regard to classes. So that's one of the things I wanted to start off with is talking to you about is the classes in this game. Are we going to see classes that are really specialized like you had in previous projects you worked on, like Dark Age of Camelot or War? Or are we going to see more hybrid styles where someone can do a bunch of different things? Oh, we're absolutely going to have specialized classes. I think that's incredibly important for this game. Uh, I have nothing against uh, the hybrid style of GW2. I mean, I loved Guild Wars 2. And, you know, I know it's not the most popular subject, you know, on... Uh, your forums these days to be a supporter of the game, but there were so many things that I thought the Arena Net guys did so very well. Uh, on the other hand, I think the hybrid style where everybody can do everything, even though they certainly weren't the first ones, you know, to do that, um, is not something we're looking to do in this game. We want people to have classes that they can really identify with, that they really care about, that they can really, you know, role play in, and I think by creating a series of classes that will not be mirrored, just to you know, uh, talk about something I have mentioned uh, on the boards and, and other places, that uh, are unique to the different realms, um, is something I think that our audience wants. It's not for everybody. It's not for you know, the masses. Uh, but for the guys that we want to play our game, I think this is something that they are looking for and we're happy to deliver. Even on the person, even though I personally, I love skill-based systems, uh, and I'd love to do a, a, a true skill-based game someday. Uh, Camelot Unchained uh, will certainly not be that. Okay, so you went further on in the blog to kind of explain that they're going to have career paths. Now, are, are we going to have a character creation where you could be, you know, a warrior or? a specialized name of a warrior? Or is it going to be like you start off as, you know, something like a, a melee type character and then based on what you do, you build through that career path to a character type? Or is that something that's picked right off the front? Uh, right now the plan is you start as you want to end up in a sense. Um, you won't be starting as, you know, a fighter, a healer, and then you could work into the specialized classes after that. Uh, we're going to put out all the information about the classes, just as I said in the blog about the stats, the abilities, everything. So, you know, whether we build the creators or other, or, uh, other groups build the creators, people will really be able to see just what their character is going to be like right from the beginning and customize it any way they want. And I think if you really want to do that, the best way to do it is allowing people to have that choice right from the beginning of, okay, this is the play style I'm looking for. I want to start as this character. I don't want to start as a fighter who I then do this, this, and this to become this class. No, you can start at this class, and then you can decide, you know, how you want to specialize yourself afterwards. Okay. So let's go a little bit away from the character classes, but still talk about something that's important, I think, for people to make choices. Um, and that is when it comes to how you're actually going to pay to play your game. You've talked about in the past having, or in the blogs, multi-tiered subs. Do you want to kind of expand upon how you guys would actually get that to work for the players and what they could expect with something like that? Okay, sure. Well, the first thing is, what I mean, what I mean by multi-tiered subs is that it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all. It's not going to be 1195 or 1295 or 1495 or 495, and that's what the only sub tier we're going to have. Uh, and, and obviously, we did the discount thing too, where if, uh, if you play three months or six months or a year, or even though we never did a lifetime, a lifetime sub. Um, I think there are better ways to set up these sub plans. And, you know, for example, over the years, we've gotten requests for family sub plans, where people have said, hey, look, my, myself, my wife, myself, my wife, my son, 
hopefully myself, my wife, and my, you know, 20 children, uh, and their cousins, you know, who also love the game, uh, would love to have a family plan. So we're looking at doing that. We're also looking at uh, plans that, you know, no matter what, and let me just be really clear about this, no matter what, we are not looking at raising the subprice. And that's been an issue that people have talked about, whether it was back in the uh, old Ultima days, mm -hmm. uh, or certainly with Camelot or EverQuest, or now with uh, modern games, about what the subprice should be. We are not looking to raise it. We're not looking to say, oh, yeah, we're going to have this sub plan where you have to buy all these uh, add-ons, and when you get to all the add-ons, it's $30 a month. We are not doing that. That is not our intent. It's quite the opposite. Uh, we think there are a lot of gamers out there uh, who like things like alts, like me, for example, and who love to have tons of alts. And there are others who might not be as keen on that uh, or might not want to play on multiple servers. And so we want to talk to the players and get better feedback on that uh, so we can tier the plans differently. Uh, but again, the key, and I, and I cannot stress this enough, I do not want to raise the price. I will not raise the, you know, the price. We want to be lower than the average price because, frankly, uh, you know, when you look at uh, most of the MMOs that have come out um, you know, just in the last 10 years without going all the way back, obviously, to Meridian uh, or the MUDs before then, um, they've provided, most of them have provided PvE content, which means more developers, which means higher costs. And we've always justified, you know, what we've charged, again, no matter whether it's us or other studios, based on the amount we're spending. Uh, since we're not going to be uh, a PvE game, uh, we won't need as many developers. So I think we should also not charge as much. So that's what we're looking at doing. Okay. Uh, so let's get away from the money for a few minutes and get back into actual game systems. Uh, one of the things that's kind of near and dear to my heart is always like crafting and resource gathering. Uh, this being a purely RVR style game, how does that really work in? I mean, is there going to be like a crafting node or something I can pick up in a battleground or an open area? How does that play into this game? Okay, so let's start with harvesting, for example. Um, people I know have asked on the forums, well, are you going to be able to skin animals or are you going to be able to skin corpses? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you know, where are you going to get... Got an uh, orc skin the, jerkin. I'm sorry? Got an orc skin jerkin. There you go. Uh, we actually talked about that in the office yesterday. Um, so obviously we need ways of people, uh, for people, excuse me, to get the resources. Some will be in uh, safer areas. Again, I'm saying safer areas. Uh, there'll be some that'll be in the few safe areas of the game. Because uh, obviously when you start the game, you really want, I don't know, the crafters to be able to craft and people to be able to harvest. And if everything is totally open, where nobody can really get a handle on things in the beginning, it would be hard for them to do their jobs. So, you know, when the game starts, there'll be some areas where the crafters will be able to, you know, uh, get to their gathering, get to their harvesting, uh, to get some of the resources they need. Uh, then there'll be areas you know, that will have uh, other resources that will be contested. Uh, the vast majority of the game, and I mean the vast, vast majority of the game, is going to be open. Uh, so you won't be able to just go, oh yeah, this is a nice, safe place, and nothing will ever happen here. Uh, no, that's not kind of how it's going to work. And then there'll be other resources, you know, especially maybe more valuable ones, uh, or mines that might have uh, richer veins. Uh, that are going to be in even more dangerous areas. And so we expect the players to go out there, you know, and fight for the areas, take control of the areas, and uh, let the resources then flow back uh, to their realm. Uh, in terms of crafting itself, um, there will certainly be a variety of places where people can craft. Um, I don't think we are going to force our crafters to go out in the middle of battle uh, in order to make a sword. Uh, but if you've looked at the trailer, uh, you've seen uh, the dialogue uh, where it says, uh, the world is shattered. Well, that's what's happened. The world is shattered. Uh, magic came through. All sorts of bad things happened. And so there's a lot of work uh, to do. I mean, you might want to say that the world is a fixer-upper. Uh, and we want to have our crafters 
uh, doing that as well. Uh, so it won't be um, just as simple as, hey, we're going to sit around and make 10,000 swords that people don't need so I can you know, move my, uh, my bar up a little. Uh, there will be a whole lot of crafting that will be needed out in the wilds um, where people will have to build some of these structures and build some of these defenses and do other things. Uh, so it won't be just a typical you know, crafting system. Uh, then, you know, talking a, a little bit more about what the crafters are going to do. Uh, look, I've seen a whole bunch of carpal tun tunnel-inducing crafting systems. Mm -hmm. I mean, Dark Age, you know, can certainly be, um, I think, correctly uh, accused of having a system uh, that people had to do a lot of, frankly, to advance. Um, that's not going to be the case here. Uh, I don't want our players... Uh, sitting around making, you know, uh, again, 10,000 swords, none of which are useful. Um, do I want players crafting to help RVR? Oh, my God, yes. Critical. Uh, but it isn't going to be, we hope. I mean, look, it's still early, and I really have learned my lesson about talking about uh, a system before it's even fully designed mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then coded and tested. Um, and so I'll simply say that what we're trying to do with our crafting system is tie it into RVR in an incredibly substantial way uh, because it is a critical system. We want our crafters to do, be doing more than just sitting around again and crafting 10,000 useless swords. And we want our crafters as well to be able to establish a real identity for themselves on the server. We want server pride, as we've talked about. We want realm pride. Well, we want crafter pride as well. We want people who, you know, really care about their profession. And if their profession is RVR, uh, that's great. If their profession is crafting, if their class is a fighter type, if their class is, you know, a mage type, we want them to care about all these and to be able to establish a name for themselves. And that's one of the things we will really need to do, you know, with the crafters as well. We want people to have a reputation on the server as a great crafter. We want guys who can specialize. So, you know, you know that, hey, if you want the best sword maker, you've got to go find this guy. And maybe he's not even sitting in town. Maybe he's sitting on a mountain somewhere. Or maybe he's sitting in a tree somewhere because that's just what he likes to do, to find the guy. That's the kind of system we want. The system where they're hiding out in the trees. No, I actually, I really... That, I mean, it's up to the crafter, right? I no, mean, yeah. It's choices. If people want to say, hey, I want to play this kind of hermit guy, and if you can find me, I will make you this great sword, or I will make you this great set of armor. Why the heck not? Let oh, them enjoy themselves. I, I totally agree with you. I actually really enjoy the fact that it sounds like the system's going to be designed to increase the amount of RVR that people want to do. I mean, instead of just walking out and getting your copper ore or getting your mithra ore, you know, if you want platinum, you got to go out into an RVR heavy area with your friends to protect you, and it would f be a focus of PvP. So that's what we want. I mean, RVR needs to be more than taking towers or taking keeps or going for relics or, you know, all the other, you know, uh, devices that people such as myself have used in these games. You know, we want to really make it not only fun for the RVRs, but make it feel important for them and give them lots of options. I mean, you know, people have asked, obviously on your forums and others as well, is that, what are they going to do? I mean, is it just going to be going out and beating each other over the heads with sticks uh, because there's no, you know, PVE? And the answer is no, there's going to be a lot more, whether, again, whether it's crafting or housing, etc. But it's also that we're going to spend the same, re uh, we're going to spend the same equivalent resources on PV, I mean on RVR that we would have on PVE. Smaller team, of course, but the idea is just like PVE of rotating in new content, doing things, creating things to keep the players happy because that's what counts. And we want to do the same thing for RVR. We want to bring in new challenges for the players. We want to bring in other, other parts of the world that they can play in. Not instance, just to be clear. Again, uh, it is open. Uh, but we want to keep things hopping. We want to keep things interesting. We want to keep them off balance at times. And I don't mean off balance in the sense of, oh, we're going to suddenly change uh, how the entire world works. I don't mean it that way. 
I mean, maybe there will be some new challenges. Maybe weather will become more of a challenge, or maybe the way magic flows may, will, may be different during certain times. We want to make sure that when the players log in to play this game, it's not the exact same experience they had a week ago or a month ago or six months ago. We need to keep things moving. We need to keep things a little bit fresh. Uh, because otherwise, you know, just like any PvE game, if we don't do that, eventually they'll get bored. And since we're not looking to be a gear grinding game, then we need to do it in other ways. And, you know, it's going to sound really simplistic and really cliched, but, and I apologize for it, but we want to focus on the fun aspects of RVR. And that means making it more challenging at times, making it, you know, a little bit different at times, and not just keeping it the same old, same old, oh my God, here we go again, if I can just get, you know, 50 more kills, you know, of the Vikings, then I'm going to tick up this bar, and then I'm going to tick up the bar again, and then I'm going to be able to get this item. You know, look, that's been done a lot. And whether it's in Dark Age, or War, or WoW, or any game, we want to be a little bit different. Hopefully a lot different. But once again, I'm avoiding the hype. <laughs> I totally understand. So it's it sounds to me like you're trying to make it more system driven to make people want to participate in RVR instead of having like a PVE equivalent award that they would get out of an RVR situation. Perfect. Well said. All right. Um, I, you guys have touched briefly upon this. I don't know that you have a whole lot of designs on it yet, but I wanted to ask about player housing. You did talk about going out into like the the RVR areas and building up uh, structures that might have been torn down. Are, is that going to be part of the housing, or is that, or is it going to be something that's kind of instance where people can hang the trophies of the dead orcs that they killed from the other faction? Do you really know, have any ideas how it's going to work yet? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let me talk about the things I can talk about, which is how it's going to work in some of the areas. Um, so if people want to spend a lot of time uh, and money, and I don't mean real real-life money. I'm talking about game cash, uh, things that you get uh, from your actions inside the game that you cannot buy, uh, again, with real money, because I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who already know how I feel about things like that. Uh, but if you spend a lot of time and money on your house, uh, I don't think you want it burned down every five minutes. Um, be kind of a quit point for people. So some housing will be, again, in the safe areas. Um, you know, if you want to build your manor, if you want to build your mansion, if you want to build your little nook and, you know, uh, cranny kind of place, you'll be able to do that in safety. However, that's only one of the systems. Uh, you'll also be able to build uh, structures, whether it's for the realm or for yourself, in the more contested areas. And that will give you uh, access to certain things. Uh, now, I expect those to get burned down. That's part of it. Um, you know, when you go into one of these areas and you start building there, well, there's a good chance, just like when you build a house on a floodplain or you build a house, uh, you know, by the ocean. Eventually something bad is going to happen. I mean, it's just as how it works. And that's how it is with RVR. If you're going to build structures, any kind of structure, in these areas, bad things will, will eventually happen to it. And that's part of the game. Uh, but... There'll be things that go along with building in those areas. And so there'll be a trade-off. Now, we know it can't be a big time or money sink, because if you do end up having to spend, let's just say, and, and just to be clear, this is not what I'm thinking about the amount of time, but let's just say it took you months to build that house. It won't, using it as an example. Let's say it took you months. It would be bad if that then got blown up by the enemy, because then you would go, wow, I don't really want to do that again. But if it took you some time, much more limited time, and it was then burned down, and your side could recapture it, and then whether you had to rebuild it, or maybe the cra crafters help you build it, or you can hire it rebuilt, then you don't feel as bad, you know, because you've done what you needed to do. You went out, you captured the territory, you got the house, you built, or you got the uh, the land, you then built the house. Uh, you got bonuses, you got certain resources for building it. And now you don't have to spend all that time to doing it yourself again. You won't feel as bad. And since it's not also intended to be a cash grind to build your house, 
then it's not like, oh my God, I spent months and months saving the money to build this house and now those damn Vikings destroyed it. Um, that would make it a quick, quick point as well. We won't do that. Um, in terms of exactly how the housing system is going to work, what you're going to be able to build and how you're going to be able to build it, that we're going to say for a little while, other than to say it's not the same system as most, if not all, the MMOs I've seen. Well, it's not the same system as any MMO I've seen, and I'm sure there are MMOs out there that, you know, whether it's in Asia or here that are talking about a similar system, but I haven't seen them. So it's going to be a bit different. should be a lot of fun, um, but we'll see what the players think. Okay. I know that with this game, you're really trying to drive player interaction as being core to the game. It's not, hey, there's an NPC, I'm going to dump all my loot on him, uh, which brings me up to the auction house and the fact that you guys aren't going to have one. Uh, how do you, do you have anything in plan? I mean, how do you think it's going to work for the economy without an auction house? I think some people are going to hate it. I mean, look, let's be blunt. Uh, auction houses were a great convenience factor. On the other hand, I think a lot of our crafters are going to like it. Um, you know, it's one of those things I'm willing to take a chance on. I want to build, you know, more interaction between players. I've called it forced social interaction. I, you know, I talked about it, you know, more than a decade ago when I saw it both in our game and other games. Um, and we're going to force it. You know, there are going to be some things that are going to be forced in terms of interaction. And some players will absolutely hate it. I know that. I, I think that the majority of them will really like it. Uh, again, the gamers that we're going for. We're trying to build a sense of community in our servers uh, and in our game. And I think part of that is having people to interact with the crafters or even crafter shops. You know, we're not going to force you to stand there 24 hours a day to sell your goods. Uh, but we do want people to know that this sword can only be bought in the house of something. You know, whatever the, the name of the guy is. Or we do want players, when they want to, to really interact and haggle and make, you know, bartering deals, you know, with the players. And you really can't do that through an auction house. I mean, obviously the mechanism is there to say, hey, you know, I will make this sword if you give me the mats. Um, but you don't get that same connection with the other player. And you don't get that same sort of, yeah, I'm getting to know this guy as a crafter. Uh, and maybe I'll get a better deal because it's the third, you know, time I've gone back to him. You know, we want that type of player to play our game. And as I've said before, I know some of the ideas we have for this game are going to piss off some players. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you want to look at things, we're ready to do that. We're trying to make a very tightly focused niche game based on a lot of things that I've seen over my career, uh, what other uh, people here have seen. We've got some hardcore MMO players here, really hardcore. And so, you know, we're getting a lot of feedback uh, and giving our feedback to each other about what we think will work and what won't work. Um, and this is one of the things that, you know, we do believe in, you know, that uh, we hope will really cause players, you know, to talk to each other more and to interact with each other and to, you know, not care in a kumbaya, you know, get the fireplace going and grab the marshmallows, uh, but more like, hey, it was really great getting to know this crafter because not only did he make good, you know, weapons, but he could do them quickly, and the prices were good, and boy, I used his sword for, you know, six months, and look at how many, you know, Vikings I killed with it. And that's what, that's what we want to do, and hopefully uh, enough players will think it's a good idea that uh, they'll play our game. Okay, that sounds great. Uh, so let's get back kind of to the money, and you, you talked about this a little bit earlier, that you don't want people to spend necessarily real money on in-game things, yet in one of the blogs you've had, you did mention the possibility of having a cash shop in the game. What kind of items would you put in that cash shop to prevent the game from be getting labeled as a pay-to-win, or people thinking that... <laughs> It happens. Anytime you put a cash shop in a game, people start throwing that tag around. How, what would you do to make sure that that did not happen to this game? Well, let me say again, 
Um, and I know I've said it on your forums and other forums as well. The only reason I mentioned the cash shop, the only reason, is just so I could mention the cash shop, because if I didn't, people would say, oh, I'm sure they're going to have a cash shop. And he, Mark just doesn't want to talk about it because he's afraid. So I, I mentioned that, hey, at least it's something we're looking at, but here are our you know, basic opinions about it and, and core beliefs about it. And people then go, oh, my God, it's going to be a pay-to-win, or he's looking to make more money. I'm not. I hate pay-to-win to play to win games. I hate them with a passion. I won't play them. I, as much as I've liked some games that I've seen, whether they're MMOs or non-MMOs, I hate those games. This will not be a play-to-win game at any level. None. Zero. Um, it just won't happen. And... That's why we've been really strong about going out with a subscription model. You know, instead of going, well, you know, we're going to look at how the market is, and, you know, maybe we'll be a buy-to-play, but, 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 but. It won't be a play-to-win. There just, just won't be anything in there, you know, that could even be possibly labeled as a pay-to-win. So what could be in there? Um... If we have this multi-tiered subscription and you want to upgrade your subscription, so maybe you started with, well, you know what, uh, I'm just dipping my toes in this whole RVR thing, but now I really like the game. Uh, can I use the cash shop to get um, more time on my account or upgrade my account so maybe I can be on multiple servers instead of saying, hey, I want this and I only want to play on one server and that's all I care about or I want to upgrade my account because now my significant other wants to play. Or possibly some cosmetic items that the crafters can't make. Um, but again, I don't know yet what's going to be in there other than to say what I know won't be in there. And there will not be any play to win things. You won't have speed up, you know, potions. You won't have anything that could give you an advantage in RVR. Um, it just won't happen. That's not the game we want, we want to make. And it's why when, one of the reasons that we're not talking to publishers or we're not, we're not even looking, let alone talking, to talk to publishers. Uh, the only people we've talked to, frankly, so far have been, you know, possibly uh, partners in other territories. Um, you know, none of that will be found in the Western games. I, again, I, I can't emphasize it enough. I hate those games as a player, you know, I really do, and I don't mind other companies, of course they can make any game they want, that's great, uh, but for me, you know, I just don't want to play a game thinking that, you know, the reason why this guy beat me is because he spent an extra 50 bucks and was able to get, you know, more potions or get a better weapon or, you know, get a better armor, and look, I know the arguments about time versus money, uh, whether it's on a you know, a PvE game or a non-MMO or, or, frankly, an MMO. Uh, but, no, there won't be anything like that in our game. I mean, just no way. How's that? Is that a good enough answer? That, that's a great answer. That's, that's what we were kind of looking for, and I'm sure a lot of people were hoping to hear. So, uh, it's the middle of February. Kickstarter is going to come out in March. It doesn't mean it's going to come out March 1st, but March... It won't is, come out March 1st. <laughs> but March is rapidly... Uh, closing in, you mentioned that you expect the game to cost in the ballpark of about $10 million to make and get out there, and that you were possibly looking for half of that from the Kickstarter. Have you come close? I mean, is $5 million the goal? Are you guys... Oh, have you guys oh, well, oh, hang on. <laughs> $5 million from the Kickstarter. Hey, that'd be great. Uh, you know, if we blew through all of our uh, stretch goals, that would be amazing, fantastic. No, what we're going to ask for is two million uh, for the Kickstarter. Two million. If we get two million, uh, and that obviously means that we fund it, uh, then myself and other investors are putting up a minimum of three million dollars more when we start the project, which gives us five million, which is enough to get the core game out, you know, to the players. Uh, and I'm frankly prepared to be in uh, if we are late. You know, this is this is a gamble. I mean, and I know that it's easy to say, oh, yeah, this is a risk. Um, you know, we're going to make a risky game. Well, here's the thing. 
whether you think, uh, whether people think that some of the things we're doing in the game are risky, whether they think we should do PVE because that's, you know, more risky in some ways, or they think we shouldn't do this feature because we, that would be more risky, or, you know, I've seen some comments that, oh, you know, uh, things he's talking about are not really risky. They're a combination of old and maybe some new stuff. Biggest risk at the end of the day is that I'm going to take my money and put it into the Kickstarter essentially along with the players, even though obviously I can't put it into the Kickstarter itself. This is part of the money we're seeking, okay? I'm putting it in because, frankly, I should. I mean, if I'm asking players, you know, to put in their money and I have the means to put in some money myself, I damn well should do that, you know? Um, obviously, we did well when we sold, you know, the company uh, to EA and we had sold a, a part of it before to TA. So we did make some money off that deal, of course. And so it would be incredibly disingenuous of me to go to the players and go, hey, fund this and I don't want to put any money in because I want you to put your money in. That's ridiculous. You know, I need to take a gamble if I'm going to ask, you know, other people to take a gamble. So, you know, it's going to be, it's really simple. Kickstarter hits two million, I put in my money. Not much more complicated than that. Uh, if, if we do more, fantastic. Then instead of uh, things coming out in expansion packs, we get to make it come out uh, right around launch or after launch, depending on how complicated the features are and which stretch goals we make. Um, you know, over the <laughs> decades now, can't even say really over the years, but over the decades when, you know, I've made games, well, I've been willing to take risks before. And, you know, there's no need to talk about, uh, again, you know, how Mythic was started or, you know, what ha would have happened if Camelot failed. Uh, but I've always believed in taking risks. You know, I, I, I was a lawyer. I had, a, you know, a fine career ahead of myself if that's what I wanted to do. Uh, I turned down a really good offer uh, with, a, you know, an agency you know, that I could have worked with uh, to make online games when everybody thought online games were really stupid. And frankly, they thought I was the biggest idiot in the world uh, for not doing what I, you know, um, no, was quite good at and trained to do as well. I did it because I love these things. I love games. I love playing games. I love making games. And, you know, this is my, hopefully not my last chance, but here's a really good opportunity for me to make a game that I want to make and make it without having to worry about, oh, my God, you know, what are the investors going to think? In this case, the investors are the players. And if the players back it, well, I know what they think. They, they're backing the kind of game I want to make and not have to worry about, you know, what my parent company, you know, wants to do. And as I've said so many times, you know, it's not that any, well, I shouldn't say any, but... It's not that every publisher is evil. They're not. And, you know, EA had some great people in it, people who, you know, I really liked and really respect and still do to this day. Um, but like any other company, there are people there that, you know, I didn't quite agree with and didn't agree with me. And that's okay. That's, you know, that's frankly how it should be. Um, you know, not everyone is going to agree. This is my chance to make the game that I and hopefully our backers want to make. And that's really exciting. And that's really, you know, boy, um, maybe fulfilling is, is a good word. Uh, to be able to just sit down again with the players, you know, whether it's on your forums or in other places, and talk to them and get feedback like I used to do uh, when I was making my MUDs or on Genie or in the, um, you know, Camelot days. And it feels so good to be able to, to do that and get responses from them and get feedback from them. And, you know, so for this game, if I can convince enough people that, you know, this vision, this concept, this whatever you want to call it, can make a good game and they will back it, then I'm right there with them and spending a lot of money to make this thing happen. And, you know, if it happens, fabulous. Uh, if it doesn't, you know, then my vision was wrong. And it will be up to the players and the, uh, hopefully the backers uh, to uh, think and to agree that the vision was right. 
Well, I genuinely hope that you get that opportunity to make this vision a reality. Uh, that being said, that's that's all the questions that I had had for you, but I've picked up a, a few really good ones from the viewers during this. Do you mind taking about two or three more questions? Oh, go right ahead. Okay. Um, you, you did kind of mention that there's going to be multiple servers. That's kind of your vision. It's not going to be like one super server, and you're big on the Realm Pride. So... Are there going to be multiple servers so people could play the different factions? They're not going to be able to play the same faction on the same server, are they? <laughs> no, not a chance. Okay. Um, since it's a, it's a PvP game, what are the chances that we're going to see player looting on this? Where I kill somebody, I get to take some of his gear. Uh, right now, none. Uh, do, we, do we know that we need a way of getting some sort of, um, well, I don't want to say loot because that just, again, conjures up the idea that you're going to get everything from the player. Um, and that's not what's going to happen. Uh, do we know we need to get something off the player in terms of uh, reward uh, for the people who kill the, you know, kill the uh, other realms? Yes. Do we want people going into combat thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to lose this great sword? No, we don't want them to do that. Uh, we have some systems that we're kicking around here that will both reward uh, the players who are victorious and not, you know, um, create a quit point for the people who have lost. Because, look, it's about fun. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about challenge. And if every time you went into combat in, in this kind of game, you thought, oh, my God, I'm going to lose all my stuff or I'm going to lose so, much, so many of my good things, well, then why would you do it? You know, if those things matter to you, you'll end up, you know, saving them in your locker or your bank or whatever, um, and only taking them out when you think you're going to win, and that's not what we want. On the other hand, we want people to get, a, you know, get something for the victory. Uh, it's kind of important in an RVR game to have rewards. So, you know, we've got some ideas that I think the players are really going to like uh, on both ends, but... You know, we'll see. I've thought they would like other things in the past, and all I got was some rotten fruit for it. Didn't even get the T-shirt, so <laughs> we'll just have to see. Okay, uh, another one real quick is has to do with a system you've had on previous games that you worked on to help, you know, show that realm pride when you're not in game, and that was the Herald you know, that they don't have anymore. You know, you could go in there and check on your realm and see how they're doing from your web browser. Is that something you could see being in Camelot Unchained? Absolutely, and no hype, so I'll just say absolutely. Okay. And then the last one I got for you is, is it going to be like tab target, or are we going to see more of this trend of action combat with this game? Well, that's one of the things we're going to talk about with the players. Uh, look, I like both. I play both styles. I like action-y games, and I also like tab targeting games. Uh, the key is going to be, you know, not to say, we have to be an action game, or we have to be a tab targeting game. Um, I think there are things that we can learn from both systems. Um, the one thing I can say, or will say, say more, but let's just say we'll say right now, is that we want a game where strategy and tactics matters more, not how quickly you can run around the field spamming, you know, uh, attacks. Um, one of the, I guess, best examples is people have asked us is, uh, magic going to be a bit more stationary? You know, are you going to have to stand still when you cast? Are you going to have to stand still when you shoot arrows? And the answer is, and I know some people are not going to like this, but the answer is yes. Um, you know, we want a game where you are going to have to make some decisions, you know, about, wow, is this the right time to fire this arrow? And not just go, you know, or hey, if I want to stand out here as a mage uh, being this kind of stationary target with a bullseye on my butt, uh, am I going to get something in return for being a bit riskier in my plane or choosing somebody who's a bit more, you know, squishy? Uh, the answer is yes again. Um, and that's something that's going to evolve over time. But the one thing I can say, again, absolutely, you will not be able to run around constantly throwing the equivalent you know, of a North Korean thermonuclear device, you know, on players by simply pushing a button and then uh, running off. It isn't going to be that simple. We want to have a combat system 
where you, you know, and your teammates have to work together a bit more rather than just trying to run around the field as quickly as you can, avoiding damage while you're spamming buttons. And again, it's not that those systems aren't fun. I've had a lot of fun with playing games like that. But that's not the game we're going for here. That's great to hear. Again, thanks, Mark. We really appreciate Don't your go time. Guys, come well, on. I can ask Rob. Okay. It's well, we a few minutes. We can. Uh, let me scroll through here through the chat. Then let's. Oh, um, in the spirit of enhancing community spirit and faction loyalty, would you ever consider opting for single character servers, where players only permitted one character per server? Wow. Okay. Yeah, I remember people asking about that, you know, from the Dark Age days. Um, hmm. I would certainly be willing to talk about that with the players. Um, I'm not sure why they really want it, you know, and, and, if, and, if, and if enough people really wanted it. Um, you know, I, I wonder maybe it, I, I'm not even quite sure why there would be a lot of demand for it. Uh, I, can, I can understand why some people might want it, but that's something we'd be certainly willing to talk to, you know, our backers and our players about. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't seem like it's something, again, just off the top of my head, that would be, oh my God, we couldn't do it under any circumstances for certain reasons. Um, but I'd have to understand more of why the players want it, and then I'd really have to think about, okay, what are the ramifications uh, about having a single character only server um, and not just off the top of my head while I'm sitting here. But I'll think about it. You know, players want to start a, a topic, for example, on uh, your forums and, mm -hmm. you know, lay out why they think it's a good idea or a bad idea. I'll certainly be willing to participate in it. All right. So if you guys want a single server or a single character server, just head over to the MMORPG.com forums and start a thread about it. Mr. Jacobs will take a look at it. Along those lines, what about a free-for-all PvP server? <laughs> yeah, that's that's whoops, uh, that's always a popular request. Um, let's get our game right uh, with three factions mm -hmm. and non uh, FFA, and then see what happens. Uh, obviously, uh, FFA is something that you know, kind of familiar with. Um, but at this point in time, I'd rather focus on, you know, just getting the, you know, Tri-Realm uh, game done. And then we'll see, uh, you know, about uh, an FFA server if there was enough demand for it. Okay. Uh, so let's say that this is April, right? And your Kickstarter has been successfully funded. You guys are going into full-on production of the game. Do you have a timeline in your head on when we're going to see you guys start working on Friends and Family Alpha, Beta, released? you got kind of a roadmap planned out already? Or well, what we've said so far is we're shooting for uh, September 2015 release with getting people in really early, uh, certainly in 2014. Um, depends on a bunch of things. Uh, certainly a studio my size uh, cannot do the full game in that amount of time, uh, so we have to hire more people. And we've spoken already to a number of people uh, who've Either we've wanted to come on board for a bit, or people who said, hey, now that you're no longer doing mobile games, uh, I'd be more interested in working with you now. Um, so we'll see. If we can get enough, you know, the right talent in quickly enough, we'll, you know, be able to get the uh, alpha starting earlier. Um, but the key for us, and I cannot stress this one enough, is that we want to have our backers in really, really early. Um, you know, we want them beating on the game. We want them, you know, beating on every system that we have. We don't want to wait, you know, until the last minute. I mean, obviously, for those who were there for the, uh, you know, Camelot beta, uh, we got people in pretty early. Uh, we were kind of mocked for that, if you remember the whole beta 1, beta 2, beta 3 thing that people would call me an idiot for because, oh, it should be called Alpha and Mark's just doing this because it's a PR thing, blah, blah, blah. And then other companies, of course, start saying the same thing. It's pretty much standard these days. Yeah. If you go back and you look at some of the comments when they announced it, it's uh, kind of humorous. Um, and we're going to do the exact same thing, except we're going to do it even earlier. Uh, we know we have to get our backers in. We want to get our backers, and we need to get our backers in. 
because frankly, we're a small studio. Uh, and you know, even if we uh, got up to 24 people, say, uh, getting us all in and beating on the game and you know, uh, running automated programs uh, to simulate other players, not quite the same thing. Uh, we need, you know, actually humans. Uh, they work so much better in some ways uh, to break things, uh, you know, than uh, our automated uh, testing would do. So we really want to get guys in early. We want to get their feedback. We'll have back of forums, as I've talked about already. We want to listen to the players. We want them, you know, to have a say in it. I mean, if you're putting in, you know, some of your hard-earned money, uh, into this game, you should have a right to have your opinions heard. Uh, we're still going to make the game we intend to make. So, so you know, obviously, people who back us and then they come in and say, "Well, but I, well, we'd love some PVE or a lot of PVE." He said, "No, we're going to make this kind of game." But as we go through and you know, come up with new ideas, or they come up with new ideas, you know, we want to be able to talk to them about it. Um, I've always believed in that. I mean, obviously, I did it, you know, for Camelot. I did it for Warhammer as well. Uh, for most of the time, and certainly while you know we were independent, I was always on the forums. Um, being independent again, I can go back and be on the forums all the time and talk to players, and so will my team. So you know, if all goes well, we'll have our uh, you know backers in earlier than you know I think they might expect. Okay, uh, what type of engine do you guys put any thought into that yet on what you're going to use? We put a lot of thought into it, and we're still going to put in more. I okay. mean, the nice thing is we don't have to make this decision today. We really don't. Um, you know, going with, when you look at all the engines out there, and obviously there's some really good engines out there. There are some engines that may not be as good out there. If you commit too early, that's just as bad as waiting uh, too long to commit. You commit too early, you decide that, okay, you're going to gear everything you can to, you know, everything you're going to do to uh, this engine. And then you're working on it for a while, and then you realize, oh, my God, we're in deep trouble. Well, that's fabulous. Now what? So we're going to take our time. We're going to keep looking at other engines. We're going to look at, you know, all the options we have. And it's great because we've got a guy like Andrew Meggs, you know, who's kind of good technically and especially graphically, and he's worked on a number of engines before. Um, and I've worked with different engines before, so we know that we can take the time uh, to pick the right one because we don't want to make a mistake. We're better off waiting and doing all the design work and doing all the concept art and building some of the systems even within the engine we're currently using with an eye to, okay, what are we going to have to migrate uh, and when are we going to have to migrate uh, to the new engine? So that will be a decision we will, we will not make today, uh, that we will take our time and we'll do it right. Uh, that's part of the whole game process anyway. Uh, we don't want to rush this game out. We aren't going to, you know, immediately go out and double the size of the team. We're not going to do some of the things that other studios have done, you know, thinking that everything is going to be fine in the end. We're going to, you know, make sure that we hire the right people. If it takes a little bit longer, it will take a little bit longer, but we'll make it, make sure that when it comes out, it will be the game that we intended it to make. And that's also why I said if I have to spend some of my own money, you know, in addition to the money I am going to spend, that's what I'm here for. Okay. Uh, any chance we'd see mounted combat in game? I'm sorry? Mounted combat? Oh, mounted. Uh, chance, yeah. It happens to be a stretch goal. Uh, at least some amount of mounted combat. Uh, and we'll talk about that as well. Uh, not in the main game. Uh, or I should say not in, the, hmm, not in the core game or the core kickstarted game because that's a lot of resources and as you know, all of the guys who are probably listening to this uh, stream know uh, that when you start to throw in whether it's a lot of players, a lot of pets, a lot of mounts, in usually not very good things happen to your frame rate. And the combat system has to be smooth. The game has to be smooth. And large battles have to be actually fun to be in. And, you know, we're not going to start with, this, with these grandiose goals of saying, for the core game, we're going to have all this stuff. You know, whether it's pets or mounted or everything else. Uh, that stuff, 
that will go all the way down at the end of the stretch goals and that I frankly don't expect, you know, we'd meet. It'd be great if it happens. Um, and even then, I am, which is why, just, and let's just be clear about this, that's why we haven't put up our Kickstarter yet uh, as well, because there are some of these stretch goals that we have to look at technically and go, mm -hmm. do we want them to even be a stretch goal? Because I'm not going to tell players that, hey, we're going to have amazing mounted combat uh, if we're not sure we can handle it. And like I said, it would be great to have, but not if it comes at the cost of, you know, having a slideshow when 30 people are on the screen at the same time. Okay. Um, you're really going to stress, stress, stress Realm Pride. What about guilds? How are guilds going to fit into it? Guild Pride is darn important. Uh, we want our guilds and the players in the guilds to feel really good about their guild. I mean, obviously, we had a, you know, some pretty good guild systems in uh, both Camelot and Warhammer. Um, I want to have pretty good guild systems this time, too. Once again, not trying to, you know, I don't want to hype. Um, we, we know it's important to have a great guild system. Um, if the guilds work together, if the guilds are rewarded for working together uh, on defending their realm. Well, that makes for a more, probably a more successful realm, uh, probably better relations between the guilds, better relations between the players. So, you know, guilds are really important, and we're going to treat them uh, as that, as very important parts of this game. Okay. We're just getting, some of the ones we're getting now are kind of really specific about, you know, people concerns with CC and, you know. Um, does anybody else out there have kind of a more general one that we can ask before we run out of time? You, are you going to make the abilities to dye armor and weapons and possibly put guild emblems on cloaks so people can rep not just their realm but their guilds? Everything up to the guild emblem. Uh, yeah. We're not sure on the guild emblems because, quite frankly, I haven't talked about that with Andrew. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of dying and all that stuff, yeah, as you guys know, I'm kind of a big fan uh, of dying uh, when it comes to uh, these type of games. And so, yeah, I can guarantee that we're going to have that system, you know, in our games. Okay, yeah. and, I, and I think this will probably be the last one. Uh, what kind of RVR progression system have you guys really figured that one out yet? That is a really complicated question, which I'll, ha I'll, ha I'll have to defer to for now, other than to say it's not going to be Realm Ranks. That's what was in Camelot. There will be Realm Progression. It will be different, because uh, the system we're talking about is different, but it's one that is geared to RVRs. And I've seen this a lot, obviously, people asking, well, are we going to have realm ranks, and we need to have, have realm ranks. But here's the thing. The game is all about RVR. So whatever progression system there is needs to be about RVR as opposed to, well, we had realm ranks, but we also had a PvE game with PvE leveling. This is all about leveling in RVR. You will not be able to level by killing what NPCs there are in the game. You know, you won't be, oh, my God, look, I just killed you know, a thousand sheep, and that ticked my bar up, and, you know, now I've got an ability. You won't be able to do that. So whether, you know, whatever form the uh, progression system, leveling system takes, it will not be geared at all to PvE. So the one that we will use, and we'll talk about this, you know, a little bit down the road, um, I think the RVR players, the ones who are actually backing our game, are going to be um, interested in, and hopefully they'll like it as well. All right. Well, I greatly appreciate your time. Uh, for those of you guys that came in late and didn't catch the full interview, we'll have this up on MMORPG.com, and we'll have it up on our YouTube channel later today. Uh, Mark, thanks for taking time out of your day to come and talk about Camelot Unchained. Uh, I hope that you reach your goals and that we get to see you go into production on this in April. Thanks, Rob, and, you know, thanks, obviously, to MMORPG for the interview and uh, for the coverage we've got, but also, you know, and I've said this on your guys' forums, and I mean it from the bottom of my heart, I really do. Thanks to everyone who's posting on the forums. Thanks to the guys who are saying, hey, we're excited about this game, and others who are saying, well, you know, wait and see. 
and even for some of the guys who I know, uh, and, and again, I've said this uh, to you guys, uh, who've been critical in the past, and some who are critical, you know, even now, thanks. I mean, believe it or not, I do care about these things. I care about making these games, and I care about, you know, what people say. And, you know, uh, I've tried, and I hope to respond to a lot of your questions on the forums, and a lot here as well. And, you know, all we really want to do is make a great game. And we're not focused on this as, you know, again, a way to get a publisher into it, into it or even get to investors, you know, in the company. The guys who are investing are investing in the game. We just want to make a really great game. And, you know, all of you guys who are listening to this, who are, you know, posting on the forums, who are giving us feedback, I honestly, I thank you so very much. Um, it is really, really appreciated. Um, and hopefully we'll continue to see, uh, you know, good feedback from you over, you know, not only the next few weeks, but, you know, hopefully many months. So thanks again to everybody uh, out there. All right. Thanks again, everybody. Make sure to catch the full interview if you came in late. Up on the